Hey everybody, welcome to This Is Not A Drill. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, we're gonna have a really important show for us. Um, conversations with three of my favorite sister, friend, comrades, um, sisters in the struggle. And we want to uplift, um, just as we get started, we wanna uplift Queen Mother Cecily Tyson, who recently transitioned just a few hours ago. And I remember thinking on her birthday, which was just a month ago, how beautiful it is to give our loved ones, our revered family, their flowers, their roses while they're still alive. And I'm grateful to women like Ava DuVernay and Patrice and so many others who uplifted Queen Mother Cecily Tyson for her birthday, um, which I believe also kind of helped her to um, transition peacefully. And so we're grateful to you. We pray that you're listening to us. We pray that our lives somehow make you proud the way that you made us proud, the way that you make us proud to be Black women, um, presenting us in such a beautiful and dignified and powerful and magical and magnificent way. So Queen Mother Cecily Tyson, we honor you and we pray that even this show, even this platform is somehow a tribute to you. Ashe. Um, so we know this is not a drill. It's really has become our political education platform for Black Lives Matter Los Angeles. And people are tuning in from around the world. We're grateful for you for tuning in every single Thursday night at 7 p.m. Um, we try to really engage in key issues around Black power, Black empowerment, um, and how we vision ourselves into the future. And so our conversation today is really, in my view, people are going to say, isn't this a public policy conversation? It is a public policy conversation, but it's a different kind of public policy conversation. So we know in Black Lives Matter, we call ourselves abolitionists. We want to make sure that as we think about abolition, we remember that abolition is not simply about how to upend unjust systems. That's part of it. That's half of it. But it's also about visioning the world in which we want to live and building towards that. And in my view, the Breathe Act is an abolitionist piece of public policy. And so we're going to talk with visionaries behind the Breathe Act, Patrice Cullors, co-founder of Black Lives Matter, Gina Clayton Johnson, founder of SE Justice and also part of the Movement for Black Lives, and our mayor um, of Compton, California, Mayor Asia Brown, who has, through the Compton Promise, really begun to think about how do we localize the BREATHE Act? How do we make commitments to our people? And so we're going to have a conversation with these three phenomenal women in just a moment. Um, before we get started with that conversation, we want to remind you that this should be a conversation, right? This should be about not just hearing what these three phenomenal women have to say, but thinking about how we take action ourselves. How do we support the BREATHE Act? And how do we do something every single day to usher in justice? So I'm gonna give you a couple of calls to action before we get started. Tomorrow, we are engaging in a global Twitter storm for Oscar Grant, justice in the name of Oscar Grant. Many of you know that in, uh, in uh, January, 2009, Oscar Grant was murdered by BART police officers at Fruitvale Station, if you saw Ryan Coogler's um, beautiful movie, Fruitvale Station, that was about Oscar Grant. The people in Oakland, my hometown, um, really organized and people around the world organized and demanded justice in the name of Oscar Grant. And we're able to get one of those officers, Johannes Meserly, convicted in that murder. But there was a second officer. Um, Anthony Peroni, who was fired from BART police, but walks free to this day. Recently, through a lot of work, including the passage of 
SB 1421, the Right to Know Bill, which um, was the first bill that Black Lives Matter co-sponsored in the state of California, we were able to get new information that demonstrates Peroni's um, complicity and role in the murder of Oscar Grant. So we are demanding that that case be reopened tomorrow, long way of saying, tomorrow, join us on Twitter from noon to one, and we are going to engage in a Twitter storm demanding that the district attorney, Nancy O'Malley, reopen the case against Anthony Peroni. Um, and we're gonna demand justice in the name of Oscar Grant. That is tomorrow, Friday, um, January 29th at noon. And you can go to tinyurl.com, maybe, um, Philip or Megan can type this in the chat, tinyurl.com slash Oscar Grant Storm, tinyurl.com slash Oscar Grant Storm. And while I'm mentioning Megan, thank you so much, Megan, for building that toolkit along with Laura so that we have graphics and sample tweets to send out. Second call to action, second call to action. On February 2nd, that's Tuesday at noon, we are going to be gathering to demand progressive justice reform. You remember that after more than three years of saying Jackie Lacey must go, we got her out of office and I wanna cuss, but my mama told me not to cuss on Facebook anymore because she's watching. So we got her A out of office, right? Um, and we were able to get a district attorney who is really carrying our agenda. The old school lock them up district attorneys, the police associations, the sheriff's associations don't like that George Gascon is saying people will only be prosecuted for the crimes that they're currently um, being accused of, that there will be no more um, gang enhancements, which we know are racist and in many cases illegal because they're illegally entering Black folks into these databases, right? That we're going to treat children as children, not try them as adults, right? Um, we're going to undo um, the death penalty that uh, only prosecutes black and brown folks, right? And so we're gonna do all of these things. And these are not George Gascon's reforms. There's many more. These are not his reforms though. These are our reforms that he is carrying. So on Tuesday, we're gonna flank him and say, we're pushing back against the District Attorneys Association. We're pushing back against the Police Association. We're pushing back against the Sheriff's Association and saying the people are stronger and we're gonna stand for progressive justice reform at 111 North Hill. That's the Stanley Moss Courthouse um, where the DA Association is trying to sue to block these progressive justice reforms. So tomorrow at noon, Twitter storm, Tuesday at noon, we're going to stand for progressive justice reform at the courthouse uh, downtown 111 North Hill. Sorry for talking so long. However, this is a conversation, call to action, need you to take action. Um, again, my name is Melina Abdullah. I'm co-founder of Black Lives Matter Los Angeles, and I am grateful to be in conversation with these powerful women. Also grateful for Pro Bono ASL. Brianna, thank you for signing for us, for translating for us, and ushering in language justice. We appreciate you, Pro Bono ASL. Um, before we get started with the conversation, we just want to give you a real quick synopsis of what the Breathe Act is. And so true to her artist self, Patrice Colors and other artists that she surrounds herself with um, built this beautiful, beautiful video um, that really summarizes the vision behind the Breathe Act. So we're gonna show that to you before we get into the conversation. Breathe. To be alive, remain alive. To feel free of restraint, breathe. Is this what liberation tastes like? Breathe. Fresh air exposition, breathe. Rest after exertion, I can't breathe. Hold up! It 
doesn't have to be like this. Imagine, what if Richard had been met with a tow truck in that parking lot instead of an armed police officer? You okay? Or what if Brianna and Ayana had slept peacefully through the night instead of being murdered in their beds? Or if a mental health professional had responded to the call about Kayla? What if they would have just let Elijah dance? What if my brother, Monty, got the treatment he needed instead of a jail cell. We are the largest and most diverse movement in the history of the world. And we are determined to create a future in which we don't have to imagine. Let me show you how. The BREATHE Act starts by ending federal funding of the police and moving to divert funds away from the punitive agencies like ICE and the DEA. No more tanks rolling through our city streets, no more children in cages, no more over-policing of black and brown neighborhoods, life sentences over dime bags, no more wrongful convictions of innocent people while abusers with money are left to go free again and again and again. This system, designed only to punish and cage, is not keeping us safe. It is not working for us. The BREATHE Act isn't only about defunding. In fact, that's just the beginning. Where are we going to put our money instead of police and prisons? By establishing federal incentives for cities and states, the next part of BREATHE allows communities to create new, non-carceral models of public safety on their own terms. These could be healing justice programs, violence and abuse interruption programs, or job opportunities for formerly incarcerated people like me. The BREATHE Act would allow these ideas to grow and expand. So the thing that makes the BREATHE Act really exciting is that it goes beyond the scope of how we traditionally view public safety. It's important that the right person shows up in an emergency. And we also need to build infrastructure to ensure that our communities are able to thrive day in and day out. That means access to healthy food and good jobs that pay a living wage and cleaning up our neighborhoods that have been poisoned for generations. That means providing housing to families, children, and all of our people who've been living in tents and in cars and who've been sleeping on the streets. That means disrupting the school to prison pipeline and making sure that our children have access to quality schools that are nurturing, safe, and supportive. And that means economic innovation in communities, including piloting universal basic income programs. Some of these names you know, many you don't. Each of these people died at the hands of our criminal legal system. They were loved, they were cherished, and their lives mattered. Their deaths have moved me and many others to fight with everything we have to end police violence and to make the BREATHE Act a reality. That's why BREATHE calls for reparations and accountability to the Black community and all those impacted by state violence. Repairing the harm done already is not a footnote, but an essential measure for progress. Finally, BREATHE includes provisions to enhance self-determination in Black communities by strengthening voting rights and ensuring that all Americans are able to have a voice in our democracy. In the words of the late, great John Lewis, let us walk together with extraordinary vision and go make some necessary good trouble.
Thank you so much for sharing that, Philip. Thank you for um, for being our support that nobody can see. We really appreciate your invisible work um, in doing that. Uh, Patrice, thank you for um, that offering. And I really appreciate the way in which you not only have vision for our people because you believe in us, but also how you allow your own personal story and own personal connections to guide you. I'm wondering if you can just begin by giving us a frame. Where did the Breathe Act come from? What's the vision behind it? Um, and how does it relate to this question of abolition? Sure, and thank you, Melina, for um, just starting us off with that beautiful, beautiful, um, like I don't even want to call it commercial sharing of of the Breathe Act. So many people that I love and adore uh, uh, really put that together and help create and bring that to life, and it's just so powerful. Um, so the Breathe Act, uh, the Breathe Act is an omnibus bill presented by the Electoral Justice Project of the Movement for Black Lives. Um, lots of people um, mix up Black Lives Matter and the Movement for Black Lives. Mm -hmm. So let me just take a moment to uh, talk about the Movement for Black Lives. The Movement for Black Lives was created after the death of Mike Brown. Uh, um, <clears throat> excuse me, it's a coalition of over 150 black led organizations across the country. And uh, it really was, uh, the Movement for Black Lives was really created because there wasn't a central place that black orgs, especially black orgs that were thinking about um, uh, progressive and radical policy and action could come together to move a black agenda forward. Um, the Breathe Act is actually, uh, I, I can't wait for Gina to talk about it next, Gina Clayton Johnson's baby. Um, she came to the Movement for Black Lives with this idea in response to the uprisings. Um, and uh, we really came together as a team because we felt like this was an important opportunity to take what was happening to this, in the streets and challenge our Congress to try to push something forward that could match what was happening in the streets. The bill really proposes to divest taxpayer dollars from policing and incarceration and invest it into alternatives. And I talk about this all the time, right? What are the alternatives? P have, uh, people having access to healthy food, people having access to an adequate education, people having access to healthcare, people having access to housing. This is a human rights bill and really looking at community-based approaches to public safety. Um, the champions of the bill, not sponsors, because we haven't actually um, uh, introduced the bill yet, but the champions of the bill include Ayanna Presley, um, the Democratic representative of Massachusetts, seventh congressional district, and Rashida Tlaib, uh, the Democratic represent representative of Michigan's 13th congressional district. Um, both of these powerful women who you all know as a part of the squad uh, uh, was at the unveiling of the Breathe Act with the Movement for Black Lives. And so much of the Breathe Act is uh, a, a visioning, a visioning of something new, a visioning um, of what radical policy can look like to really save human lives. What we have right now um, in this country uh, and, and a country that is invested in policing and incarceration is a country that is invested in death and destruction. The Breathe Act is trying to uh, invest in life and reimagining. And so I wanna actually um, just remind this team that uh, one of the first places that uh, gets captured, one of the first things that um, gets taken from us is our imagination. And the Breathe Act, um, I remember reading it for the first time and feeling moved to tears by the legislation because it reads like poetry um, and it reminds us how much we actually deserve as Black people in this country. 
that's really, really beautiful. Um, and I don't, I mean, who talks about legislation as beautiful, right? But it is, it's beautiful and it's imaginative and it's um, someone's typing. Yes, it does read like poetry. It reads like poetry. I mean, e even the title of it, the Breathe Act is poetic, right? Um, and for it to be inspired by George Floyd. And when we think about that, I can't breathe, this is um, powerful and visionary and poetic and um, really revolutionary, um, which is strange for me as a trained political scientist to be calling public policy revolutionary and radical and abolitionist and imaginative and all of those things. But that speaks to who you are, Gina Clayton Johnson, right? So how did this come to you? How was this birth to you? Patrice talks about it as your baby. How did this come through you? Well, um, so first of all, it is such an honor to be here with all of you. And, um, you know, all, all of you in this group are just some of my um, just dearest, most adored comrades and sheroes in the work. And I just um, think, you know, when I think about the fact that we're here talk, having this conversation um, so near the transition of um, our now ancestor, Cicely Tyson, I think about for what she represented to me was a reflection of the dignity of Black women. And when I think about how important it is to have reflections of our dignity so that we can, we can be reminded um, I also think about the Breathe Act as a reflection of dignity, as when you read it, it reflects back to you th that we have and deserve dignity in some very fundamental ways that I think we are encouraged to forget. And there was a way in which, you know, the, the, the conversation, you know, as of last summer, last spring, when we were in the middle of uh, you know, another round of Black uprising, over 600 cities across the country uh, stood up and demanded defund the police, demanded that Trump resign, demanded that we invest in communities, that we saw a, um, a response that was quite frankly, and I'm just going <laughs> to say it like I think it is, um, lackluster and um, insufficient to meet the moment by our federal policymakers. Um, we saw, you know, some 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 federal response, but quite frankly, you know, the the women in our organization and all of the folks who I know, you know, you all organize represent the, the folks in Compton and in, in your district, Mayor Brown. I mean, we are thinking not only about accountability. Of course, we want accountability and we want justice on the other side of the taking of one of our loved ones of one of our family members um, when they, uh, you know, when they are murdered by police or taken by the system in, in a, a vile and inhumane ways. Um, but don't we also just want to prevent that in the first place from happening? Don't we also just want to live in a, in a way that is safe and free? And so the BREATHE Act is the answer to the question, what does it take to ensure Black safety in this country? And and by virtue of our safety, everybody's safety. What does it take to allow for us to live safely and freely, right? And so the Breathe Act came out of this realization that in, you know, in places like LA, because BLM LA, because of organizing, we were actually seeing wins along these lines. We were seeing tremendous progress, tremendous courage by, by people in elected office, doing all kinds of things to make it possible for our systems to, to roll back on the ineffective and punitive and inhumane policies that lead us into cages and into cuffs and, and start to do the right thing in terms of making investments in alternatives. And what was happening on, as you know, kind of the national conversation took hold, was that we were seeing again new 
solutions that were not solutions, being uplifted, um, things that we would have ensured more money to law enforcement, um, you know, training and, and, you know, body cameras and all that mess that we know does is not effective and does not deal with the fundamental power issues that are at play inside of our system. And so the breathe that came out of this need to really make an intervention in this. And I think one of the, one of the things I'll just say to, to, to talk, to speak to your question about the origin, you know, one of the things that I think people <laughs> are curious about oftentimes is how in the world did you manage to move that quickly, right? To go from, um, you know, this, this moment, this political opportunity, this, this moment of uprising, all of a sudden to producing an over 100 page omnibus federal bill. I mean, this is the largest federal bill ever to be presented by any social movement to Congress in history, right? It is huge. And you can find it at breatheact.org. This is political education. You also read it. Um, you have your homework. Um, but, you know, the reason why that was possible was because it's actually the, the Breathe Act sits on the shoulders of a, a almost two year long process by the Movement for Black Lives policy table to produce the vision for Black Lives, which is our policy platform. And that took over 60 Black led, Black centered groups, policy visionaries, um, you know, experts, organizers from across this country, distributed across communities, to engage in a community led process to dis to identify solutions. Right. So we already had the solutions when we met at the at the at the kitchen table about this. When it was me, Trees, you know, all of us. It was a group of ten of us, um, all black strategists who sat together and said, all right, now we need to figure out how we're going to turn this into, into federal legislation. So um, it was quite a, a, you know, quite a feat, but we are just, I think, at the beginning of the Breathe Act story and definitely need, um, you know, all of y'all listening to get involved, uh, get read up, and then, and then get active around this bill. I love that. I love that story. Um, I love how it was birthed. And I love that we were, you know, we got a saying, you know, be ready so you ain't got to get ready, right? We, <laughs> we were already building is what I'm hearing. We were already building. And I think about that also, like with this moment in terms of activism, um, people are saying, well, how did BLM get this resurgence? Well, we had, we never stopped organizing. We never stopped building. And so just because we fell out the headlines didn't mean that we stopped. We were consistent and constant in our work. And so when the moment hit, we were already organized to make it a movement. And the same thing, the movement exists in many different ways. And we have to use all of our gifts and talents to usher in greater justice. And so one of the things I have a, a problem with is I always introduce people based on my relationships with them. So I'm like, y'all know Patrice, right? Um, Gina Clayton Johnson is brilliant, right? Like, and I wanted to tell like the story of how I met you and the first time being up in that mountain, whatever y'all had at that retreat at, right? But people are going, and you're going, and we're sitting around the table. Gina Clayton Johnson is brilliant. She is a Harvard trained attorney um, who founded SE Justice Group. And so I want to be real clear this is, these are brilliant, beautiful people. They are my sister, friend, comrades, and they have stuff that they've that has prepared them also individually for this moment. Patrice Colors is co-founder of Black Lives Matter, also um, professor and author. And um, I don't even know how many organizations you founded. Like in your actual bio, I'm like, she forgot about the Coalition to End Sheriff's Violence, which is actually predates Dignity and Power Now. You got so many you know, that we can't even list all of the ones that you've done. And then Mayor Asia Brown, I believe, aren't you the youngest mayor um, to, yes. So as we pass it to you, um, I am going to give the personal story a little bit that um, I first met you when you were first elected as mayor of Compton. And I remember that you were being groomed, you know, 
Um, a lot of the black political gatekeepers saw you and your brilliance. And another thing we all have in common is we all have some, not that I ever represent this, but we all have some affiliation with USC, right? So undergrad, grad, some, we all have some degree from USC, right? And so Mayor Brown is introduced. She also went to USC and there's, you know, all this, um, I think it was Mark Ridley Thomas who was going, you got to watch her. She's going to, she's the one, right? And you have been, you have been a star for us. But more than that, um, I'm watching you as you decide, and I would love for this to be the first question you respond to, as you, I've watched you decide that vision is more important than your own personal aspirations. And I'm, I was really taken by you when I first met you, but I'm more taken by you now when I watch you stand up to the sheriffs, when I watched you say people in Compton have a right to live with, you know, um, a certain level of dignity is the word that we keep hearing as I watch you fight. And let's be clear, everybody who is grooming you isn't always happy with your fight, right? But as I watch you authentically fight for our people. Um, so I'm trying to combine the bio with how much I appreciate and cherish the way that you're walking into this work and the way that you're representing us. So I'd love if you would start with kind of that, what resonated for you and what made you um, really usher in kind of this localized practice of the Breathe Act, the localized implementation of the Breathe Act, which is called the Compton Promise, right? Yes, the Compton Pledge. Um, Compton Pledge, yes. Well, first, I'm honored to be um, with these just power powerhouse women. Um, they are all of you are incredible, um, and this is just such a, a powerful moment of time. And I see the behind the scenes that goes into strategizing and organizing and continuing the fight and pushing things through and and being the tactician and all, all of the the sacrifices that people will never see. And I just want to honor you all for that. Um, and Dr. Molina. Obviously, you're a part of all of this work, but um, I just want to thank you for being such a, a bright star and a strong voice. And before I met you, I had never quite seen a, a woman in academia uh, in, in your bold stance and just being unapologetic and deliberate about fighting for Black people. And um, when, when we live in a world where people want us to be grouped in with people of color, while we obviously fight for all people of color and what benefits black lives benefits all but you have been unapologetically black in places that didn't necessarily want to hear that so i just want to acknowledge you and honor you for that um and i just want to share before i get into the compton pledge just the how this came to be and a little bit about the vision for compton as well first um we all talked about the connection to usc but um, as I was a, a baby freshman, I took a class called LA and the American Dream. And it was a, a walk through the, the physical formation of Los Angeles that was really codified with Jim Crow laws. And I will never forget there was this privileged white male that raised his hand because he was just tired of hearing about the truth and said, well, does racism even exist anymore? And from then a, a fire lit inside of me like someone threw gasoline and I was determined um, to number one, learn every single aspect of how our society um, intentionally systemically uh, really disadvantaged black people. But I also wanted to learn, well, how do we reverse the curse of poverty? And so that is how I um, really got into learning about urban planning policy and development. And that's ultimately what I learned in school um, got my master's there at USC and then spent 10 years just working in, in underserved communities, learning and fighting and really understanding how the system worked because I wanted to infiltrate the system in order to change it. And as I ran for mayor, um, I had nothing to do with anyone political. I didn't, I, I did not know Mark Ridley Thomas. People thought that he, he plucked me from some special place in heaven. Um, I, I did not know him. I, I met him at USC um, at the Empowerment Congress, but um, I was already on a mission. And while I thank him for his support, 
Um, th this fire was, was lit from my own experience being raised by a single black mother that fought for every single opportunity that she bestowed my brother and I. Um, and fast forwarding, I knew that if the same policies that can disenfranchise my people could be the same tool that liberates us. And so fast forwarding, when I ran for mayor, I didn't run about Asia Brown. It was the vision for Compton and the vision for Compton had 12, it was a 12 point policy package that really has many of the same qualities as the Breathe Act. And so as I see the Breathe Act manifested at the federal level, it is truly a landmark bill that can truly provide tangible equity for black people. And it is the, the cornerstone for, in my opinion, reparations for the 21st century. And when we talk about all of the systemic um, violence that we that is inflicted on black people and the trauma and the cycles of all of that, at the end of it all, it, it's codified in the way this, this institution, this nation was built and it was never built for us and it was built to disadvantage us. And so knowing that inherently that the black code, the black codes then morphed into the Jim Crow laws that then morphed into the way that black people were able to live physically, geographically, we were forced to, to only access certain areas. And then they stripped by cutting, slashing government budgets, all of the resources that are able to create opportunities and create pathways out of poverty into opportunity. And so fast forwarding to where we are today, we cannot as a nation expect for poverty to just phase itself out. And that's where the Compton Pledge comes in that it provides number one, a, an oxygen mask to black and brown people that have been plagued by poverty systemically, intentionally, and that they in turn need just a, a, the basic necessity of poverty floor in the richest nation in the world. If we can send billions of aid to other countries, we should send billions of aid to the, the, the American people that are paying taxes living on American soil. And so in Compton, we partnered and raised private funding to fund um, guaranteed income for two years for 800 Compton residents that are paid bi-monthly regular cash payments. There are no strings attached because we respect humans and recognize that when given the opportunity, human beings will put on their own oxygen mask and do what's best for them and their families. And there has been empirical data for decades, stemming back to the 50s and 60s that prove that guaranteed income is effective. And so in Compton, here we are providing uh, this much needed aid, but also studying the impact of providing people with cash payments, but also providing an opportunity for additional financial literacy and other empowerment tools, and then also measuring the mental health and well being of our people. For me, it's not just about giving someone cash, but I want to know how, how is their well being improved? How is that, their outlook, their hope in life improved? Because I know what it's like to be in poverty, and you feel hopeless, you feel bound. And so we want to measure how, how do people feel liberated and in turn make different decisions for their families and also ultimately improve their trajectory. And so this is about not only providing people what they deserve, a basic poverty floor in the richest nation in the world, but also to be able to measure that their well-being as human beings, because we, we have to, we have to, number one, identify that this nation is being robbed and it, there's, it's rotted by greed. When we think about just the, the widening income and the wealth, the wealth gaps between white people and people of color, it, it's staggering and it's, it's compounding and it's exponentially uh, increasing. And the same with the 99% of American taxpayers and in comparison to the 1% of the wealthy, um, but it is, it, it's staggering. And so as a nation, there is a, we're at a reckoning period where I believe the BREATHE Act will be able to put some feet uh, to the fire to, to our legislators and actually give them, you, you all have given them the, the blueprint on how to begin to address systemic policy and, and, and inequality, and quite frankly, the dehumanization of black and brown people in America. So I'm honored to be um, a part of this dynamic team that sees the value in human beings and has decided to uh, raise money to be able to provide uh, just a, a basic income for people, especially in a time where we're all weathering the, the storm of the, the COVID-19 pandemic. And I am infuriated that we are even talking about fighting for an additional uh, stimulus payment. 
it, it's unreal to think that trillions of dollars have gone out in the CARES Act and only pennies are actually landing in communities of color. And lastly, as I close, the relief of COVID-19 has been so politicized that only large communities are actually getting federal relief. There are, for, for every $100,000 per person that's invested in large communities that are overwhelmingly not a minority communities, we are receiving at the, the local level 12 to $15 in communities of color in comparison. And so- Say that, that again, say the, the ratio again. So for, for cities that are, that are under 250,000 people population wise, we are only receiving 12 to $15 per person in, in relief, CARES Act relief. In comparison to large cities um, like Los Angeles and even Los Angeles County, where they are receiving over $100,000 per person. And so there's already an inherent disparity in, in places like Compton, where the majority of cities in California specifically are not large populated places. They're places of 100,000 residents or less. And so there's additional disparities being built in even to where we are with COVID relief. And so there's just compounding disparities that we need to address. But I believe that the BREATHE Act is landmark and will provide us with a, a, a blueprint and to actually have outcome oriented investment in public dollars. So here's the thing, when I'm hearing what you're saying, there's two problems with that. One is that you're getting less money, but two is that Los Angeles is getting so much money, but it's not getting to black people, like zero, <laughs> zero dollars. There's no money going to black owned businesses, black people, they're projecting now that there'll be uh, more than 100,000 new unhoused folks um, in Los Angeles as a result of COVID-19, and that's in the next year, right? We're already at 60,000. They're projecting another 100,000, mostly Black folks. Um, and so if they're getting money, who are they giving it to? Where is it going if Black people are unhoused? And I think that gets to this question that I think is really inherent to the BREATHE Act, right? That we have to remember, and even the chant, defund the police, right? It really is about budgets being ultimate moral and ethical documents, right? That budgets are, I loved what you said, that we have billions of dollars to give around the country. We have billions of dollars to prop up big corporations. There's money that allowed Jeff Bezos to quadruple his wealth in the midst of this pandemic, right? That allowed Elon Musk to um, become, he's project, projected to soon be the richest man in the world, right? In the midst of the pandemic, but our people are living on the streets. Our people are losing their jobs. 40 to 50% of black owned businesses are projected to permanently fail, permanently go under in the midst of this pandemic because there is a choice being made by policymakers to spend on police, prisons, jails, and propping up rampant capitalism, rampant white supremacist capitalism while everyone else suffers. And so I really want to invite Gina to come back in and talk about how, um, what Asia, Mayor Brown was saying, how we can use policy differently. Um, so yes, you know, Audre Lorde is absolutely right. The master's tools will never dismantle the master's house. However, you can start chopping that shit a little bit, right? Um, and so, um, Gina, do you want to just jump back in about how policy as a tool can be used? Absolutely. But, I, you know, I'm really interested in this. What you said, you know, Dr. Molina on the is just so so critical this point about budgets being moral and ethical documents and one of the things that i think we are going to get pushed back on fam around the breathe act is around the cost right people are like oh my goodness it's going to be so expensive we don't have the money right we always hear that we always hear that but let me tell you that we thought about that too and just within the repeal of the section, the, the section one programs, we have $14.79 billion that will be coming back into 
play, right? So that is some money. Then we have cut the DOD budget by 10%. That's $74 billion in addition to that $14 billion that, that comes from the program cuts. And then, and when I talk about program cuts, I'm talking about the COPS program. I'm talking about the 1099, 1033 program. I'm talking about all of the, you know, programs that have gone to underwrite the incarceration and policing in, in this country and over the last 40 years. Um, but the big kicker, the actual, because that still wouldn't pay for it, the kinds of robust investments that the Breathe Act makes, the, the real money in the Breathe Act comes from our reforms of the tax provisions. And we actually repeal the Trump tax cuts and approximately $1.5 trillion would be coming back uh, from that repeal alone. And so, so there's a way in which like, I think that you know, we have approached not just the, the issues of, um, you know, we write in universal basic income into the Breathe Act, like that is in the Breathe Act. And it's, it's inspired by the leadership and the success of, of what, what, you know, Mayor Brown is doing in Compton. Um, we see that that works. And the Breathe Act specifically, um, you know, we have, a, we have a couple of different universal basic income type measures, including uh, this universal child benefit that I really like, where if you have a child under the age of six, that you would get $500 a month. And there's no income cap on that. It's just a $500 a month, uh, you know, uh, payment that you would receive to help you with your, you know, raise your child. And we know what that will do. It, what it will do is it will cut child poverty in half in this country, huge. And the outcomes of that are safety outcomes, their health outcomes, um, and more. And so I think like, I think this is a visionary bill. I think there's more, um, you know, so many more ways beyond just the passage of the federal legislation that we will see this show up. Um, we hope that everybody listening will be pushing um, their local mayors. <laughs> um, if you live in Compton, you don't need to do that, really. <laughs> you have an advocate right here already in, in Mayor Brown. But, you know, wherever you are, there is something to push along these lines that I think we, um, that we really need the support of. So um, breatheact.org is a place to go to find out more information and then, you know, click in with, um, continue to stay connected with BLMLA for, for more, um, more ways to further the, the effort. But I'm really proud of the universal basic income provisions in, in the bill. Absolutely. And then just tangibly, right? When we talk about where we are, we don't yet have sponsors for the bill. It hasn't been introduced, but it has been unveiled, right? So breatheact.org so people can understand what it is. What are the next steps? One of the questions coming in from Facebook is, how do we pressure the Biden-Harris administration to adopt the BREATHE Act? We know that if the president and vice president get behind it, it will get a sponsor very quickly, right? And we'll move differently. What are the next steps that we can take? How can um, we pressure not just locally, but um, for it to be adopted? Someone is saying on Facebook, the executive orders are great, but we need more than executive orders. We need legislation. Absolutely. So I'm, I'm so glad for this question. We do need to put pressure on our members of Congress um, to take very seriously the BREATHE Act. There, there are portions of the BREATHE Act that we actually can see move independently in different, in different bills, right? So we have just the Section 1 um, uh, divestments. We can move that immediately through through independent bills. We can do that with the baby bonds initiatives. Um, we already know that uh, there are, there's, you know, esteemed members of our Congressional Black Caucus or, or in the Senate, actually, I think uh, Senator Booker is a big supporter of that. We can move things like that and should be pushing um, pieces of this where we can. Um, but I also do, I really do believe that, um, you know, in, in the words of one of our for mothers, Esther Cooper Jackson in the work, you know, no small amount of change would do, right? There's a way in which like we do need to remind our legislators 
to be courageous and to and to do something big. Um, and so I think that we, while we can move pieces of this, we also need to be encouraging support, championing, and co-sponsoring the Breathe Act. Um, the second thing is we can put pressure on the administrative agencies. And so Department of Health and Human Services, um, the Department of Justice. Um, there are things that we can we can ask of them immediately, and we've already been making those requests. We have a series of demands that we are we are meeting with them about um, in order to move breathe through that avenue. And finally, locally, we know that mass incarceration and the criminal legal system operates primarily up on the authority of our states um, and the political decisions that are made in our local spaces. And so the BREATHE Act deals with that by providing incentives to states and local places to contract their systems, decarcerate, decriminalize. But there's a lot that states can do on their own in that regard as well. Um, and so we actually have model state and local policy um, that we can share and that I think is available on our website and can provide, Move for Black Lives can provide tech support around. Um, if you want to, uh, if you have, uh, uh, interest in organization to move those bill, a breathe bill locally, um, that's possible and I think very necessary as well. Great. And Patrice, um, I wanted to pull you into the conversation because one of the critiques that we're getting um, in Black Lives Matter, but also in the movement for Black Lives more broadly, is about you know, people, some people appreciate our policy work, but then we also have organizers on the ground who think that when we move policy work, it means that we're abandoning protest, right? And we want to make it real clear that we're not saying we're moving from protest to politics. It's that it, we, transformation requires both protest and politics. Can you talk about that? How um, protest and organizing on the ground um, as well as policy work um, complements each other. Yes, um, and it matters what kind of policy work. And so um, progressive radical policies that help change the material conditions for people at the margins, Black people in particular, is absolutely necessary in order for us not to, just to survive, but thrive. Um, everybody understands that Jim Crow was policy. Um, that was a policy, and that was a policy that um, dehumanized, dehumanized Black people. I mean, yes, it discriminated against Black, black people, but it dehumanized and traumatized Black people. Um, when we're talking about policy, we're not talking about policy that is um, just Band-Aid policies. We're talking about policies that are upending and transforming the systems that we currently exist in. Um, it's that kind of policy that has allowed us to be where we're at today. While we're still fighting um, for justice as Black people, um, that there are ancestors who have fought hard and won, um, not just through protests um, and not just by protest, but also by radical progressive policy. I always say we need a multi-prong approach um, in this work. Uh, it's absolutely necessary. I think when you abandon um, the idea uh, of, of policy, you, have, you abandon the idea of being able to have a multi-prong approach to um, ensure that we actually are fighting for Black lives. I also just want to say that, um, you know, there, just to add to this point, Melina, there's been, there was a fake tweet that got created, it didn't go viral, thank goodness, but there was a fake tweet that got created um, using the Black Lives Matter Twitter um, handle that said, um, aren't you upset that you let jo Joe Biden use you? And this idea that, that Black people are not savvy, that we're just these um, puppets being strung along by elected officials is so racist. Um, the fact that uh, we knew that um, electing Joe Biden was a compromise. Um, that wasn't who many of us called for to be the president. But what we also knew is that we had to beat a fascist. We had to beat uh, active white supremacist. 
And that was not just necessary for black people, but it was necessary for all of us. And so this idea that we are not radical or that you know because we chose to um, ensure that we got Biden, um, that we got Trump out of office that makes us not radical is so short-sighted um, and it's politically lazy. And so the work of organizers is that we are politically savvy and some of the most politically savvy people um, are black women. It's why there are four black women having this conversation about one of the most radical policies that we can put forward here in the United States is because we're not just thinking about politics, we're thinking about human beings and human lives. And that feels very, very, very important in, in this conversation. And so anybody who's watching this, um, who has um, issues with uh, Black Lives Matter entering into the electoral space, um, we were never not in the electoral space. We made an active decision over the last few years uh, before um, Trump got into office. We made an active decision to challenge both parties. We're still doing that, but we challenged the Democratic Party because the Democratic Party had milked votes from black people for years and didn't give us much. In fact, they created a crime bill. They created all of this upset. And so it was actually po a, a politically savvy move for us to challenge the Democratic Party and remind them, hey, you cannot just have our votes anymore. And that's how we entered into this um, race uh, last year as well. Um, not just at the national level, but also here at the local level, as we uh, heard about from, from Melina around uh, Black Lives Matter Los Angeles challenge uh, with Jackie Lacey. And so, um, you know, at the end of the day, I'll just say, follow the lead of Black women. I know I do. Um, I promise you, you'll get to the promised land. Um, uh, we always deliver y'all. And, uh, and you always just, you know, you always end up having your foot in your mouth because you decided not to follow us. And that's your fault, not ours. I love that. I love that. And of authentic Black women, right? Authentic Black women. Black women who represent Black people, who are down for Black people, not just their own ambitions. Um, what black is women name? like Mayor Asia Brown. Yes. Who we want to figure out. I want to um, ask you the last question before we um, begin our closeout, Mayor Brown. You mentioned that this universal basic income you raised enough money for 800 people in Compton to get this universal basic income. You've been you know, stalwart in making sure that um, you expose, especially this terrible sheriff that we have, right? Um, and really been visionary and courageous in saying, you know, I wanna push um, forward a visionary platform for my city of, what do you have, 100,000 residents? Yes. Yeah, 100,000 residents. How do we help you? How do we help you say, we wanna expand universal basic income? How do we help you? Um, how do we flank you? Because that's one of the things that we're looking at. How do we flank those who are willing to be courageous like you? Uh, thank you, Dr. Mayo. Um, well, first the organization uh, Mayors for Guaranteed Income is a national movement um, of a coalition of mayors spearheaded by mayor, uh, former mayor Michael Tubbs of Stockton. And we are, we've grown to 34 mayors across the nation that have taken a pledge to institute guaranteed income programs within their communities. And my request is that if people are living in a community and their mayor has not taken the pledge to put some feet under their, uh, some fire under their feet and have them to join the movement and do the work that it takes to raise the money to be able to provide direct relief to residents um, within their communities right now. Um, we, if we haven't learned anything, unfortunately, in this time is that if we're waiting for, unfortunately, the federal government to react um, in our communities, we'll be waiting for a long time. We'll probably be homeless um, and some people will not even be alive. And so because I don't know anyone that can live in, through the midst of a pandemic with a $2,000 stimulus or a $600 and a $1,200, not even $2,000 yet. Um, so that being said, we, we need to support mayors um, pledging to support this movement. But then 
even more importantly, congressional representatives, senators, governors, uh, th this work can be implemented at the federal level. It should be implemented at the state level. And there just is not enough accountability for other legislators other than those that serve locally. Most people don't know what their congressperson or their senator or their assembly person or even what their governor um, is empowered to do for them. And so in times where we obviously are, are unstable economically and we're particularly black people are bearing the brunt of this pandemic um, from every every angle health wise uh, economically educationally all, all of these impacts will be compounded over time and take a very intentional strategy and investment for recovery and so we have to be proactive now um, I just want to highlight as well that we talked earlier about the the, the disparity of uh, wealth that's been just generated uh, especially for the the super uh, the uber wealthy, during this pandemic, well, there isn't. There should be a national outcry about the the actually not even the potential, the impending impoverishment of Americans and the the widespread uh, expansion of poverty within our communities. It it literally is a national emergency. But because it only impacts poor people, it is not elevated as a priority for our nation. And so we're in turn focused on bailing out corporations and other institutions that have nothing to do with how people live. And it definitely doesn't have to do anything with the tax dollars that people are paying steadily to this government that really is not representing us. So I urge people to get active um, on the, Patrice, you said some very profound, powerful words about activism and how it must at this day and age converge with policy and I would just like to add that the change that we all fight and march for, it must be codified in, in our institutions through policy. Otherwise, it's just a moment, of a moment in time. And you can have one elected official just coalesce to whatever the, the, the movement is at that time. And then the next set comes in and they start from scratch. So we have to do the work of policy. That, that's the work of sustainability. That's how we can actually build by having policies in place that we can in turn expand and continue the, the work of changing the system because that's what we're all fighting against is this system that was not built for us it was built against us and that that must be changed at the policy level because that's where the inequalities were actually developed and, and instituted so I, I just want to uh, share that and thank you for giving me the opportunity to be with you all this evening I'm, I'm truly honored and i've been looking forward to this uh, for quite some time so thank you well, we're grateful we're grateful and um everybody can follow the compton pledge um, and make sure that we get a Los Angeles pledge and an Inglewood pledge and a, wherever you are, we want a pledge, right? And we want that pledge to go from 800 to 100,000, right? We want um, everybody, the vision really is for everybody to have a universal basic income. We live in a world where there is abundance. Everybody can have all of what they need and most of what they want everyone can have it and we're watching as they make decisions that deny us that right it is our right it is our right to have the things that we need to live dignified and healthy and beautiful lives and so we can make that happen by engaging i want to remind folks that this is not a drill is on every single thursday at seven o'clock right here at facebook.com slash blmla we want to remind you of the calls to action tomorrow. Get on Twitter at noon, and we want to tweet in the name of Oscar Grant. You can go to tinyurl.com slash Oscar Grant Storm. If you need a reminder, there's a storm outside right now. So, you know, Oscar Grant Storm, tinyurl.com slash Oscar Grant Storm tomorrow at noon. On Tuesday, the second at noon, we're gonna be asking everybody to meet, meet us in front of the Stanley Moss Courthouse. We're gonna demand progressive justice reforms and push back against these police associations that disguise themselves and claim to be unions. They are not unions. They don't represent the will of working class people. They re represent the narrow interests of often murderous and corrupt police. Um, and so we're gonna be pushing back, that's in person. Um, uh, in front of the Stanley Moss Courthouse Tuesday at noon. Again, I wanna thank our guests. Thank you, Mayor Asia Brown of Compton. Thank you, Patrice Cullors, co-founder of Black Lives Matter. Thank you, Gina Clayton Johnson, 
founder of SE Justice and with the Movement for Black Lives Policy Table. This was really an indulgence for me to be among three of my favorite sister friend comrades and um, we're grateful for you. May the spirit of Cecily Tyson continue to move us forward. May we honor our mightiest ancestors, our most courageous and righteous ancestors with our work. Ashe, amen, amin. Appreciate y'all. See you next week, inshallah. Thank and you. And thank you, Pro Bono ASL. Thank you. Thank you, Melina.